articles like I read to you about that crash and detailing what happened to him. Is there still a machine here? Yes. Yes, yeah, so we just we just got an update. Updated um, machine. machine. Just so, installed it yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> so, so no one's used me. it yet. I just tested it this yeah. morning. Yeah. So, but we still have all the newspapers That's good. from 1824 That's really good. to 2013. We have the newspapers locally, Albion and Holly. And Medina has Medina papers. So the local papers are all collected at the local libraries. Um, this woman who is, was uh, Marjorie Hubbard. I most assuredly do remember this event. I was 20 years of age at the time. It was a Sunday afternoon, if I'm not mistaken, and a sunny day even for the month of February. I had decided to take the dog out for a walk. I believe it was around 3.30, 4 o'clock. I heard the plane overhead and so looked up to see where it was. I stood watching it for a few minutes when suddenly there was smoke coming from it and what sounded like an explosion of some sort. The plane started to come downward and then the pilot suddenly got out and started to fall. Needless to say, I could not believe what I was seeing. I ran back to the house yelling to my father that a plane was going to crash and that the pilot had jumped out. The chute did not open immediately and I was relieved to see it when it finally did open. My father took one look and we could see that it was not too far away and so drove over to the Latin road west of us and then north for approximately a quarter of a mile where we saw him come down in the George Lamont apple orchard on the east side of the road. Reno Doc and Harry Kidney had just gotten there ahead of us. The pilot had come down in an apple tree and was hanging there from the limbs. His trousers were gone. Reno Doc and Harry Kidney got to the pilot first and were trying to figure out how to get him out of the parachute harness. The pilot was able to tell them how to unfasten the chute and they lowered him to the ground. Reno Doc got his pickup truck fairly close and they carried him and got him in and took him to the Arnold Gregory Memorial Hospital. My father, John Cast, and I and Harry Kidney, and I believe my brother, Roland, was there also, got the parachute out of the tree. If I recollect right, I believe we had to get a ladder as it was caught on some of the high limbs. My father took me back to the house with my brother and then took the parachute up to the sheriff's office. He called Bell Aircraft Company in Buffalo to let them know where the parachute was and where the pilot had been taken. Later that evening, a representative from Bell Aircraft stopped at our house and talked to my father and also asked to talk to me, wanted to know what I had seen, and so on. The plane went down in a field on the west side of Latin Road, and this is south of Route 104. If I remember correctly, one of the wings was found some distance from the rest of the wreckage. We did go to see the holes where the wreckage had been. Reno Doc, Harry Kidney, and my father, John Cast are no longer living. As to the doctor who might have taken care of him, it could have been Dr. David Cooper, who is no longer living. I do not know if, in fact, he was the doctor who treated him. There was another doctor in town at that time, but his name escapes me at this time. The Bell Aircraft sent my father a, a Mento, which was a silver-colored model plane on a pedestal. It just came to me that the other doctor in town at that time was Dr. Walter Shifton. Please excuse this if it sounds as though I've rambled, as I'm trying to remember details. It's been a long time since this happened, but I do remember it well. At the time that this happened, my name was Marjorie Cast. I have since been married, and my last name is now Hubbard. Please pass this info on to the pilot, Richard Frost, and if you wish, you may send him this letter. If he wished to contact me, he may do so. I'm leaving this Saturday for a five to six week trip to Alaska. I should be back by September 22nd at the latest. The least these are, at least these are present plans. If he wishes to call me, she gives his, her telephone number. At the moment, this is all I can recollect. I hope some of this information will be helpful to you. So that was Marjorie Cash. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, there was one, um, Mrs. Charles Plummer, uh, wrote a note to, uh, in the forties that said, I think the doctor who took charge of the pilot was Dr. David Cooper. 
So we've got two votes for Cooper and one for the other gentleman. But um, he was treated at Arnold Grader. We know that for sure. Um, this was part of an article on him. Um, he remained at Arnold Gregory Hospital six days following extensive surgery and treatment before being sent on to Millard Fillmore Hospital in Buffalo for further treatment and rehabilitation. The burns became infected and he was told he was the first Buffalo patient to be treated with penicillin because Bell was testing planes for the government. So penicillin was the new thing. Mr. Frost was pleased to be able to find a contemporary news article describing the event with names of his rescuers, Harry Kidney and Reno Doc. John Cass brought the parachute to the sheriff's office. The name of the doctor was not given and he is interested to know who treated him and names of others we may also have helped. Mr. Frost complimented the library on having microfilm reader printer and extensive run of Albion papers in machine readable format. He promises to send a 1944 photograph and his written account of the event to be placed in the Swan Library archives. He also made a generous gift to the library. Evelyn Lyman has agreed to forward any pertinent information to Mr. Frost. So he visited, see if I, So there were articles in the paper, this is Medina Journal, Flyer Richard Frost finds info on 1944 bailout at library. So he did come here in 1990 and did research of his own to find out what the newspapers said about his article, about his adventure, and what happened to him. Um, this is Gerard wrote to Evelyn. Thank you for your recent letter about the Christmas crosses. It's important that voices of reason and restraint be heard in the midst of uproar. I had meant to write to you regarding the pilot who had parachuted over Orleans County in World War II. While several of the individuals involved are dead, my father and uncle Homer and Jade Morrissey remember the incident fairly well. As I understand it, the pilot drifted easterly across the Morrissey Farm 2910 Latin Road in the town of Gaines and landed east of Latin Road on the Lamont Farm. This might help sol solve a small mystery. Over the years, two watches were found in the Morrissey Orchard with no claimants. One was self-winding Hamilton, which I wore for many years until it stopped. Did the pilot, I lost the clipping with his name, lose a watch in the mishap? He wishes he could write or call my father or myself, and she, he leaves it at phone numbers, if we can give him any helpful information. So Gerard wrote a letter also uh, about the event. Um, also, um, Richard Frost wrote an article to Evelyn. Dear Evelyn, probably heard from Gerard and or Homer Morrissey by now that I've talked to each of them and received the Hamilton wristwatch, which was the subject of your wonderful 11791 letter. So he had been here, visited here, and now he's writing back to Evelyn. Unfortunately, an expert jeweler, a friend of ours, who inspected it very carefully and found that its self-winding movement had been made in Switzerland and had been repaired twice by a jeweler whose identification mark there was P1, learning that self-winding watches did not enter the U.S. market until at least the early 1950s. What? So they proved that the watches that were found out there weren't involved in the crash in any sort. Um, he says, in either case, it seems most likely that the watch itself would have been, would have evidenced its exposure to that intense roaring blast. So um, what, what they were doing was, Mr. Frost was saying that neither watch that they found there belonged to him. I think of my comment here that, that Frost called me, and I talked to him um, from, from Colorado, mm -hmm. and I sent the Hamilton watch to him, that, mm -hmm. uh, which I'd worn for years, and it was an expensive watch. My father didn't understand, it wasn't a farm worker who'd lost mm -hmm. and Frost called me back and thanked me for sending it, mm -hmm. and he said it's not it's not the watch I wore, 
And I said, after so many, I didn't know the name of the jeweler, but he said, after so many years, how can you be so sure? And he said, it doesn't match the burn mark. Uh -huh. The burn mark on his arm had the shape of the Y, but it didn't match. And it didn't I was match. I with that. Yeah. But, you know, this 20, 25 years later, right. the burn mark is still so visible that you can tell what the yeah. size of the Y is. It didn't match the brand. It didn't match the brand, <laughs> yeah. He was branded by it, but it's just stunning. Um, this is a little bit of information about him, uh, and he was involved with another famous flyer that we've all heard of. Frost was Bell's best engineer on the X-1. His innate familiarity with the rocket plane and its systems was crucial to the success of the project. Jack Ridley was almost a twin to Dick Frost. They were from different backgrounds, and they seemed to think exactly alike. Frost handled all the direct hardware and modifications to the X-1 after the Air Force took over. Once Jaeger was free of the B-29, he was on his own, but for the two Lockheed F-80 chase planes piloted by Frost and Hoover. Frost flew low for the initial drop in case anything went wrong, which it often did. As an experienced test pilot and one of the first men to fly the X-1, he knew how to fix or deal with most problems. During one flight, Jaeger's windscreen iced over so badly he couldn't see, so Dick Frost talked him down to a safe blind landing on the lake bed. So he even flew with Chuck Jaeger on his learning to fly so that he could break the sound barrier, which is what his claim to fame was. Um, this was in the Journal Register in 1990. Albion... Richard H. Frost of Colorado came to Swan Library on the 16th in search of information relating to the 1944 event, which interrupted his career as a 25-year-old test pilot for Bell Aircraft of Buffalo. On February 6, 1944, Frost was 35,000 feet above Albion when the engine pistons froze and the engine of the fighter plane he was test flying began to heat up, smoke, and finally burst into flames. I'd had engines smoke before, but when flames burst through the rubber dome under my feet and knees, filling the cockpit with yellow smoke, I radioed in, I'd probably have to bail out. The door slides wouldn't move, expanded with the heat. He worked to, to undo his safety harness and maneuver the plane to force himself up into the cockpit dome. Surprisingly, he found a window panel to try to force himself through slipstream, but he has no recollection as to how the rest of his body emerged from the burning plane. He returned to consciousness in free fall and was able to use his badly burned hand to pull the chute ripcord and drag his broken arm onto his lap. Several panels of the chute were burned, and his descent was rapid, he says. Fortunately, the chute tangled in an apple tree on the George Lamont farm, slowing the final few feet by tearing of the rest of the chute until he found himself lying in the snow under a tree, trousers, gloves, and much of his headgear burned away. He remembers calling for help, being found and placed in the back of a truck and driven to a nearby hospital where he was treated by a small white-haired doctor. Frost remained at the Arnold Gregory Hospital six days following the intensive surgery and treatment before being sent on to Millard Fillmore. So that is essentially what he remembers about that day. Um, that, was, that was Cooper. <coughs> it was Cooper, the white-haired man. Yeah. Well, there was there was some, you heard, they were trying to figure out who the doctor was. Mm -hmm. But essentially, everybody in the beginning thought it was Cooper. Um, this is... This is a letter that, and I only, I only read part of it because it's several pages long, um, that Dick Frost wrote to Evelyn in August of 1990. He had been here earlier, I think it was July. Thanks so very much for all you did to make our search for 46 and a half year old information about my only previous acquaintance with Albion and its wonderful care of drop-in visitors so <laughs> successful. As I'm sure you know by now, we found George Lamont, and he not only showed us where I'd landed when he was seven years old, but led us to a meeting with John Tel Telvosky, who now owns the Plummer Farm, 
and having witnessed the airplane burning, could show us where it landed. Then before driving back to Rochester with a friend we were visiting, we went over to meet Pete Nesbitt of Pine Hill Farms and thank him for having offered me so much help when I was referred to him as the next most likely source after you because of his naval aviator career. Like you and everyone else we met, he and his wife Dana couldn't have been nicer. Here are the bailout accounts and related copies of the pictures, so I promise to complete your record. The second last of the latter was taken about six weeks before my bailout. Incidentally, the man standing at the right and the third picture was my best friend, Bob Borchardt, who was killed five weeks after my accident, his plane diving straight into the ground in a full power dive from about 25,000 feet. Uh, after Bob had been knocked unconscious or killed, when the metal model of a bubble canopy on his P-63D King Cobra prototype supposedly came unlocked and swept across the cockpit, fracturing his skull and for breaking his neck in the process. I point to telling you of this is that one of the men who gave me your name that Sunday afternoon when I asked if he had and his companion remembered a a, trash, a crash in early 1944 near Albion told me of Bob's. Recalling this leads me to ask you if your same microfilm reel doesn't have the same sort of detailed summary of this as the one about my, my escape. So he was still having um, correspondence with Evelyn, asking her if there was microfilm on this crash. And... Um, I think he found that he found more here than he had expected to. And he returned the favor by, now I have photocopies of the wreck where he showed the, the picture of the wreck of the plane. And there's about three pictures. They're, they're bad because they're photocopied pictures probably off of a newspaper article. But um, he did send information as much as he could, and he sent his own account, which is several pages, as you can see. Um, he wrote his own account while David Fr Dick Frost bailout while an experimental test pilot for Bell Aircraft Corporation. Um, he wrote this account. It's one, three pages long, four pages long, and then he also puts an appendix at the end of it, so... It's here if you would like to read the whole thing, but I won't go into it because it kind of rehashes everything we've said. Um, he's, he tells more detail about how he got out of the plane, what happened, and what he thinks broke his arm, what he thinks broke his leg. Um, he was trying to get the window open, which I opened when I could no longer see the panel for smoke, so I pulled my left leg up and stuck it out the window. Since I was probably doing close to 400 miles per hour at this time, the slipstream twisted my foot outboard and aft, dislocating my knee and leaving it with all four ligaments torn and permanently stretched. But I didn't feel any of this. So he describes what it was like to be in that crash. Um, he goes on and tells about the men getting him out of the harness and into the truck. Um, and drove to Albion, which I believe had the only doctor and hospital for miles around. By the time we got there and they carried me in, the shock and adrenaline which had kept me from feeling pain as the injuries occurred no longer did so. And I recall, without regret, my subsequent outburst at the nurse who kept trying to pull my leather flight jacket off over my broken arm and burned hands, despite my telling her to leave it alone until the doctor arrived to handle it. He finally came, told her the same thing, and proceeded to administer chloroform while having me count backwards from 100. At about 80, he began to re relocate the knee by twisting and pulling my leg, which caused me to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not out yet. <laughs> but that pain made it happen right then. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Um, <laughs> he was yelling at the doctor, and I don't blame him. Um, from then on, most of my test flying was in conjunction with being the initial project engineer 
also on three subsequent radio control projects for Lockheed P-80 and the Navy's F-7F dive testing, then converting to two P-39s into Navy target drones. Uh, these programs were followed by my being assigned to complete the X-1s and FP-80s, but sometimes co-piloted the B-29 mothership instead. The success of this program resulted in the Air Force then borrowing me from Bell for six months to teach their flight test crew all about the X-1s. As part of this responsibility, I also flew chase on Chuck Yeager's flights during the period, one being the world's first at supersonic speed and several others. He was nice enough to mention me in his autobiography. So he ended up flying with Chuck Yeager teaching Chuck Yeager how to fly. Um, he died um, November 4th, 1996 of cancer. As project engineer for the Bell X-1 rocket aircraft, Frost was a chase pilot when Charles Chuck Yeager first exceeded March 1st in the X-1. Frost held more than respect for him. Um, and then it says, Richard Frost graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 1940 and went to work as a test pilot for Bell Aircraft in 1943. He also worked as an engineer for Bell and was assigned to the X-1 project where he, Chuck, where he taught Chuck Yeager about the plane. Frost left Bell in 1949 and began working as an engineer for Stanley Aviation in Buffalo. He was promoted to flight manager in 1954 and moved to Denver. In 1960, he started his own company, Frost Engineering, known for developing equipment and pilot safety devices for the Air Force and Army. Mr. Frost retired in 1986, but remained active with his company until it was sold in 94. In the House of Representatives, August 5th, 1998, Mr. Hall of Ohio submitted the following concurrent resolution, which was referred to the Committee on National Security. Honoring the accomplishments of members of the United States Air Force and other Americans working under Air Force leadership, who contributed to the development of supersonic flight technology. Richard H. Frost, Bell Aircraft Corporation test pilot and engineer, who provided technical instruction, guidance, and counsel to the Bell XS-1 aircraft test team as it approached ever higher speeds in pursuit of the goal of supersonic flight. So he was even noted by Congress after his death. Okay, has anybody got any questions or comments? Yeah, the, the, I didn't hear you tell me what model or what model Bell aircraft he was flying. It, it was probably either the P-39 or the P-63. Um, they referred to it as a fighter. Yeah. It was yeah. experimental, so whether it went in production after Yeah, that, I'm not sure. Part, yeah, that's another part. Is that why he was flying so high to test it? Yeah, he yeah, was they testing. Off like yeah. High. Well, they, they have superchargers on on the airplane, so they did go high, but yeah. Three miles? Yeah. Why, why was it so high? Probably to see how high it could go. Yeah, yeah it was a matter of finding well, out how found, what, the out. Yeah. Were, yeah. what the limitations were. What the limitations were, yeah. And just to clarify a couple things, Harry Kidney was a um, farm on Ridge Road and, and lived in that in that area, the big Kidney family there. And, um, and George Lamont they're referring to is uh, the grandfather of the younger George Lamont. Mm -hmm. So when they say the George Lamont farm, that would be the... Um, yeah, um, back in the, that and, day, it would have been his grandfather. And John Cast was town supervisor, and he's uh, David Cass, David Cass's grandfather, Sammy Cass's father. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in well, those years that had to have been grandparents. My right. is deceased, too, isn't she? I assume she has to be, but I don't think. And I think from Raleigh, I've seen her. That's um, yeah. Um, I think so. And the um, and they talked about Densmore Road. The um, the plane crashed near Crandall Road, um, and he he landed in the orchard on the um, east side of Latin Road. Densmore Road's the next road over. 
So it, it's in between Latin Road and, and But that, that is what was reported at the time. Right. What I'm reading right. is from the York newspaper. Was between Latin Road and Dunsmore Road. Yeah. So we know where it was. But they're just saying that the plan, the plane landed and crashed one place and he yeah. floated over yeah, and landed another. Yeah. yeah. But I had never heard about it. If Dale hadn't asked me, and I was around in 1990. I worked at the library in 1990. But I don't ever remember hearing about this man coming. But he came, he talked to Evelyn, did research. But I never heard anything about it. So I, when, I, when Dale asked me about it, I thought, okay, I'm going to find out what this is all about. But um, So it was quite detailed, quite a, quite a big deal. It would be, my goodness. Um, a test plane out of Buffalo. And the man being hurt so badly. Um, well, I'm going to see about penicillin. He yeah. got out of the plane, yeah. he got the chute open, he landed where there's farm workers who would throw... There were actual him. people there outside. Yeah. And his leg was broken, so it being hanging in the tree was a blessing for him. Yeah. And uh, then they used penicillin. Yeah, yeah. and he was uh, in the first to use penicillin. Yeah, because it, it, it was wartime, it was wartime related. Yeah. And so he was given access to penicillin, which other people wouldn't have had access Right, to. but he was working for the government. Right. And that was another in the yeah. door and no for him to get penicillin. A, a regular injured and, person and would not get penicillin. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 So all those things kind of melded together. And, and saved got his him. life. I mean, that's... Uh, yeah. Well, and then to story. end up with a congressional notice, yeah. I think is quite the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And Jaeger both had, uh, was breaking the sound barrier and as an astronaut, yes. both. And he was a teacher of Jaeger yeah. who broke the sound barrier. So he had quite a resume yeah. at the end of his life. And I think that it was unfortunate that he crashed, but I enjoyed following his yeah, life yeah. to find out what happened to him. And he recovered enough to... To have an active life, active and, yeah, life. and to found his, flying, to found his own corporation. Yeah. You know, yeah, I can remember um, when Stanley Aviation they had a hangar at on the Buffalo Airport. Oh yeah, and then one of the things they did, they had they talked about that P eighty, the Stanley Aviation um, modified it. They put a second cockpit. They were looking at prone flying, where where you're actually laying down, laying down, you know, because you can you can handle more G's. You don't black out if you're laying uh -huh. if you're laying flat and and so they had another canopy on the, in the nose and so he was laying down in the nose and they had a canopy on there but mm -hmm. it was I think it's difficult because you gotta lift you gotta hold your head up. You gotta hold your head up you know, yeah. and look up, yeah. you know, and it's it's pretty awkward. It's you know, it's some it may be safer but it's more difficult. Yeah, yeah. 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 The Germans built some gliders that were that had they laid prone in the glider because it mm -hmm. could have a smaller Cross section. If you weren't sitting down, yeah. you know, it could be narrower. They had a much more efficient. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And the and the the quote windshield wouldn't have to be as high. Yep. Yeah. So right. the yeah. the air is going to float over it yeah. at a lower angle. Well, they designed some bicycles with a prone because you're more powerful. Your yeah. legs mm -hmm. more powerful. So wearing a glider, you probably would have had more power um, in a prone position. The Germans knew that. Yeah. Well, this wasn't a powered glider. It was, a, it was a, just a, it was a sailplane, but they were testing right, the concept they, of tailless aircraft. So mm -hmm. they, they would have had um, foot foot controls of some sort for the uh, for, yeah for the rudder for the rudder and so yeah, forth. Yeah, 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 so they had more power on that. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Well, thanks for listening. Well, that was fascinating. Um, yeah, so it was it was fun to research because. I didn't know anything about it, and yet it happened when I was here. I mean, the man came to do research while I was actually at the Swan Library. Yeah. Um, and these, these farm workers, who I knew who they were, seeing a, a, a man flying, falling from the sky on fire. I mean, what, what? Yeah. yeah. They had no reference point. They would have been, you know, they probably knew where the airplane was, but they had no yeah. reference point of what. Um, yeah, and they, well, he's in one account, he said he had to tell tell the guys how to unhook his parachute. Yeah, he was so conscious Because they didn't know yeah. he was conscious enough to know that they weren't getting it off. Yeah. yeah. And he had to tell them how to unhook his parachute. Yeah. And then the one lady stop trying to take the harness off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the nurse. The nurse, the nurse yeah. was, uh, yeah. yeah, trying they, to take his, his jacket off, and he had a broken arm. And yeah. the more she pulled on it, the worse it hurt. Yeah.
and it, it made reference to the King Cobra. Well, the airplanes that they built first were the, the Bell Air Cobra, the P-39, and it, has, it was kind of a radical airplane because the engine was actually behind the pilot, and then mm -hmm. and they wanted to put the engine at the center of gravity to make it more maneuverable. So the engine was behind the pilot, and then the, the drive shaft from the engine went underneath the pilot in between his legs, and then there was a gearbox in the front. Uh -huh. And then the, the, the propeller, they had built it around a cannon, and the cannon fired through the, the hub of the propeller. So there wasn't a drive shaft in the way, and so they didn't have to worry about synchronizing it mm. with because oh, okay. because yeah. a lot of the fighters they had guns on the no on the nose, and they had to fire, so they had to mechanically synchronize them so that the, the bullet wouldn't shoot the propeller off. But mm. this one, it was in it was in the center of the airplane, and you didn't have to worry you about synchronizing worry about with anything, and you didn't have to worry about the recoil. Yeah. Oh. And then so they built the P thirty nine Air Cobra, and they built most more of them than. Oh. You know, than the other one, then the, the King Cobra was basically the same design but larger. It had a bigger engine, it had a four bladed propeller instead of a three bladed propeller, mm -hmm. a taller tail because it had more torque for, with a with a bigger engine. Mm -hmm. And then they they sent a bunch of both the Air Cobra and the King Cobra went to Russia under the Lend Lease program. Uh -huh. So a lot of them were were flown across by Alaska, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Russians put them to good use. As, yeah. No, it was it was really at the time. Yes, it was during the war, but they were still moving forward on how they were uh, um, manufacturing the planes, how they were altering them. Yep. And he was a test pilot for one of the manufacturers, mm -hmm. yep. and what he was testing was a model that they were working on. Yep. Yeah. But something exploded. And Bell would have been a very important manufacturer at that time. Oh, yeah. 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 Extremely important. Yeah. Yeah, in Buffalo, it was a big deal. Yeah, but I thought it was remarkable how he continued with his life. Yeah, I mean, after being injured that badly. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, yeah. And then that many weeks in the hospital, and he still went back to it. Must mm -hmm. have been a passion of his. Yeah. And developed things that did his own corporation. Yeah. So it's the Bell Plant. It's actually on the Niagara Falls Airport. It was Buffalo area, but it was really we we town of Wheatfield is where the plant is, but it's at the, it's on the what's now the Niagara Falls Airport. What was the Niagara Falls Airport mm. then? Uh, Niagara Falls Boulevard. It's on Niagara Falls Boulevard. Boulevard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The airport. And then the other big manufacturer was Curtis Wright, and they were on Genesee Street, you know, on the edge of the Buffalo Airport, ah. and they built thirteen thousand of the P forty Warhawks, you know, the the uh, Chenault's fighter, volunteer fighter, mm. they went to China to fight the Japanese, uh -huh. and then they built airplanes through the war, and then at the end of the war, they didn't have anything, they didn't have any follow-on contracts, they didn't develop yeah. an airliner, they didn't, they went after a couple military contractors and, and other companies it. built, so they, you know, they were the richest aircraft company in America, and they did, had no plan for follow-on, and so they went, they got out of the airplane business. Yeah. 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 Huh. What's happening with the Bell plant? Uh, it's sort of subdivided. There's still the hangar still got some airplanes from the Niagara Aerospace Museum, like the X-22 with a four-engine vertical takeoff airplane, you know, four four turbo shaft engines, and it had propellers on each corner. And that airplane is owned by the, the the Aerospace Museum, but it's too big to get in the museum, which is the former. Um, Niagara Falls Airport Terminal Building. They built a new terminal building, so that so it's just too big to get it in there. So. And how essential Buffalo was to the war. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was, you know, Bell was a huge manufacturer, and my father had a friend that, that, that who actually was involved in the design of the X one, uh, and then and then so they had Bell building the P forty, and then oh that P the P thirty nine Air Cobra, and then the King Cobra, and they also built the P-63, which was the first jet-powered airplane. They built that, you know, they built like 60 of them, but that was the first jet airplane built in the United States. It was built as a fighter. Uh -huh. And then and then consolidated aircraft, they built flying boats, and they were in Buffalo, and, and they, they flew uh, on Lake Erie, but they soon discovered that this, that Buffalo is not a good place to fly and test flying boats, because in the wintertime, the lake freezes over, mm -hmm. and so, so um, the guy, I can't his name, 
he asked his wife where she wanted to move. Do you, what, did you want to move to Los Angeles or San Diego? And she picked San Diego. So that's where consolidated aircraft moved. And ah. they built airplanes all through World War II and, you know, and uh, into at least the, the, you know, probably into the 70s. They, and they got merged into something mm -hmm. else. But, but they had, they were, they, so they had three giants that were, were here in the Buffalo area. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, thank for you. listening. Thank you. Really, really, really fascinating story. Yeah, I, I was just fascinated with it. And all these little interconnections here. Yeah. 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 Well, for something to happen right here. Yeah. I mean, it happened in our county. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the man came to our county to research what happened to him as far as administrators. Mm -hmm. I think it's an awesome story. Yeah. And, and he knew that people carried him to the hospital, but he didn't know who, who they were. I, yeah. I know who they were. Right. The he I found that know. out later on yeah. some, yeah, because he talked to the families. And he could find out in the newspaper which family it was that helped him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, right. everybody, for coming. So uh, did he recorded this, correct? Uh, yes. Yes. I'm, I'm still recording. Okay. Actually, I'm about to hit the stop button. Okay. Yeah.